Rob Schenk, welcome to A Pastor and a Philosopher Walking to a Bar. Thank you. I don't get to a bar very often, so uh, <laughs> really appreciate the invitation. Excellent. Well, I'm glad we could oblige you. Um, Rob, can you, we, we connected in New York uh, a bit, and it was brilliant to watch the short, the film that, that, that's pretty much about your story and be able to connect, but can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you're, what you're doing? Yeah, well, uh, like you guys, I'm a soul who occupies this uh, mysterious earth of ours, uh, but um, I have a bigger story than that. Uh, I was raised in upstate New York, born into a nominally Jewish home. My father had been born Jewish. My mother had converted to Judaism to marry him. It really wasn't a religious act for her. It was meant to calm the concerns of his family that he was marrying outside the faith. She had been born and baptized Catholic, raised Episcopalian. So uh, it was a rough go, you know, in, in those days, uh, interreligious marriages were not popular on either side of that equation. So uh, they made a pledge to raise their children, four of us uh, with Jewish identities, but they gave us the freedom to explore faith for ourselves. And we each did that. Uh, my brother, my identical twin brother, Paul and I uh, ended up befriending the son of a Methodist minister who had a very deep personal Christian faith and that was intriguing to us. And at age 16, I made a public profession of Christian faith in a little country church on an island. And just in case you guys are playing a trivia game, the largest freshwater island in the United States, Grand Island, sits between the U.S. and Canada in the Niagara River, eight miles upstream from Niagara Falls. So now you know all those, uh, all, all <laughs> those particulars. And that's where I was raised, and that's where I came uh, to embrace Christian faith. And uh, I was very counterculture. Uh, my first act of protest was against the Vietnam War when I was 13 years old. Uh, I was involved in the environmentalist movement before it was called that. It was called the ecology movement, uh, again, when I was a teenager. And I saw Jesus as a radical, as a kind of revolutionary. And I found that very appealing. And it's one of the things that drew me to the gospel and then to the horror of all my Republican friends. I will make this public profession, this, this confession to you guys, that at age 18, I cast my first presidential vote for the born again candidate in 1976, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. Carter. Yeah. A Democrat. <laughs> it horrifies, horrifies all my my Republican friends. <laughs> but uh, as time went on, I got into a stream of American evangelical life that was becoming more and more politicized. And by 1984, I had been to Bible college. I had been ordained as a minister. I was traveling as an evangelist, a young evangelist. And I took my seat uh, at the uh, 1984 annual convention of the National Association of Evangelicals when, uh, when President Ronald Reagan became the first sitting United States president to address a body of evangelicals. And I was there and I came under the Reagan uh, glow. <laughs> And from there, my life, my ministry took a very different trajectory. And I think you probably want to get into that later. So I'll, <laughs> I'll stop the filibuster there. <laughs> what are you doing now, Rob? So let's, we'll pause there. But yeah, what are you doing now? Yeah, uh, well, in my, um, in my 47th year of Christian ministry, I'm trying to figure that out <laughs> because for the last seven years, I've directed the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute named for my 
uh, earthly hero. You can see him over my shoulder here in my study because I have regular conversations and arguments with him. <laughs> He's my posthumous spiritual director, young World War II era uh, German Lutheran pastor uh, who was one of the first voices in his 20s, in his late 20s, one of the first voices to speak out against Adolf Hitler and the coming horror of Nazi uh, dictatorship and the Third Reich and uh, all the attendant and ghastly crimes against humanity that would come. He was one of the first to see the specter of that and to speak out against it. He would uh, he would lead a resistance movement uh, in part against Hitler and Nazism, mostly from the vantage point of preserving the integrity of uh, the witness, the Christian witness and gospel in his country. And as I'm sure you guys and so many others know, at age 39, he was murdered. He was hanged uh, at Flossenburg concentration camp, but not before leaving a marvelous body of work, principally on Christian ethics. I have all the volumes in those blue binders, those blue uh, books over my head here. Uh, and uh, before that, of course, I was on Capitol Hill for 30 years mm -hmm. as an activist on the religious right, something I I look at very differently than I did uh, during those years. Uh, and, and I have a lot of regret attendant uh, to it. But at the same time, there were some good things about those years, and I reflect on those a lot now. I'm getting ready to make a transition probably to the last stop that I'll make on my professional ministry journey, which is uh, on the faculty of something called the Miller Center for Interreligious Learning and Leadership at Hebrew College. And I know you guys uh, have had Or Rose, a rabbi uh, and director, founder of that uh, center on uh, your podcast, and I'll be joining Orr and the amazing community of Hebrew College uh, in a new endeavor, lecturing on Christianity and uh, religious leadership, and all that uh, against the backdrop of being a new grandfather, which is the greatest joy right. of my life. So um, that's it in a nutshell. That's got to feel like a full circle moment, though, where you grew up the, the son of a Jewish father and, you know, Christian mother, and now you're moving into teaching at a Hebrew, yeah, Jewish institution and teaching Dietrich Bonhoeffer there. I mean, what a, what a full circle moment. So you have a fascinating story, Rob. I've been excited to share you with our guests for, for quite a while. And I want to get into that fascinating bit. So you hinted, you brought us to 1984, Ronald Reagan addressing the National Association of Evangelicals. Um, can you bring us into that world. And even I love the way I've heard you describe it. You talked about your faith journey as a journey of three different conversions. You told us a little bit about the first one and 16 year old, you know, uh, in that small church, seeing Jesus as a radical and revolutionary, but then you had a second and then a third conversion. Can you tell our listeners about that journey? Yeah. Um, that initial conversion was a very beautiful one. It introduced me to a, a wonderful, new family, uh, people who were very concerned about the poor, about the marginalized, about the forgotten, about the isolated, the despised, the rejected people. Uh, and it, it, for me, that reoriented my life. It, it added a third dimension, what I like to call the third dimension of spirituality, because while we were uh, Jewish in a cultural sense, our, our family was not a religious family at all. So it brought spirituality into my life. Uh, and, uh, you know, we called each other brothers and sisters, and it expanded my sense of family and community. But by the mid 80s, something was happening, a, a phenomenon was taking place in the United States. And 
that was American evangelicals were finding their place, not just at the political table, though they were in a very big and pronounced way, but they were also kind of finding their place in a prestigious mm -hmm. sense. In other words, you know, evangelical churches were growing. We called it, you know, the church growth era. Many of the mega churches that we talk about today started blossoming in the, in the mid 1980s. And suddenly, American evangelicals were no longer, you know, the people of the church on the other side of the tracks. We didn't identify with the down and outer because we were the up and comers. Mm -hmm. We were emerging, we had the biggest buildings the biggest budgets, the biggest staffs. We had the biggest or at least expanding media enterprises. A lot of our institutions were bigger and better moneyed than the old uh, mainline religious Christian Protestant institutions. Our denominations were bursting at the seams and so on. So needless to say, there was a kind of feeling of Pride, you know, uh, we were getting full of ourselves. And then comes Ronald Reagan and his, uh, you know, his partnership with Jerry Falwell of the old time gospel hour and, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, and later Liberty college which became liberty university now the largest evangelical institution of higher learning in the world uh, all of that was was just emerging uh in the late 70s to the mid 80s and boy that gave us political clout mm -hmm. and i came under that spell and in the mid-1980s, I accepted Ronald Reagan as my personal political lord and savior. <laughs> I, I, say that, oh, man. <laughs> I, I say that facetiously, but I, I call my second conversion my conversion to Ronald Reagan Republican religion, which is distinctly different from the faith community that Jesus established. And I would stay fixed in that place for the next, uh, I lose count after a while, but like 30 plus years. And it would propel me into leadership within the national pro-life, read that anti-abortion movement, um, which would propel me to Washington, D.C., where I established a ministry called Faith and Action. We were headquartered on Capitol Hill. My big bragging point during all those years was we were across the street from the Supreme Court, three minutes from the U.S. Capitol, 10 minutes from the White House, right in the center of the action. And we used our, our clout to influence uh, elected and appointed officials to adopt policies and practices, legislation, uh, and ultimately rulings of the Supreme Court that were in favor of the way we imagined America should be. But then something else happened. Want me to keep going? Well, I want you to <laughs> I want you to pause for a second because you under are a bit understated, but I mean. Tell us about your relationships with, you know, just briefly, tell us about your relationships with senators, with Supreme Court justices, with presidents, with, you know, I mean, I've got a feeling you were chaplain as well for Congress, I think, right? So I've got a feeling you had some deep connections, whether it might be the Jerry Falwells of the world or the Orrin Hatches and such of the world. Can you tell us about some of those, about your world that you were swimming in in those days? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, I wasn't quite a chaplain for Congress, but I worked very closely with the chaplain's office. I was a civilian chaplain, but I wasn't a government chaplain. And when I landed on Capitol Hill, I surveyed, you know, 
the landscape politically, and I saw there was a fair amount of Christian work going on, for example, at the White House during the Clinton years. Again, scandalous, you know, infamous Democratic liberal president. And yet uh, they had standing room only crowds in the in the White House Bible study groups. So, you know, I said, well, looks like things are, are going pretty well there. And then I looked at the Congress. I landed in 1994, which happened to be the year when the largest number of Republicans were elected. They took uh, the, um, the majority in the Congress for the first time in 40 years. Um, and as far as we knew, the largest number of evangelicals were elected to Congress. So I started working with a lot of fellow uh, believers, I guess I would describe them as, uh, at least people who were sympathetic to my worldview, uh, and did a lot of, uh, of work uh, building relationships, including with Mike Pence. Uh, obviously former vice president, but I got to know him when he was a member of the House. He was part of that uh, new freshman group coming in. He would later uh, become governor of Indiana, and then he would return to Washington as vice president. And now, of course, he's, he's a candidate for president in 24. So um, got to know people like Mike Pence, prayed with them, visited them often, and I gave out a slew of plaques of the Ten Commandments that I asked them to display and to obey, which hundreds of them did over the years. But the big, the big challenge was not the executive branch, the White House and president and the presidency. It wasn't the Congress. It was the courts the federal courts and particularly the Supreme Court. And that's where I would focus my attention for about a 20 year period. And I got very deep inside the Supreme Court, got to know the conservative members of the court, particularly the late Justice Antonin Scalia and Justices Thomas and Alito, who are in a all a, a bowl is it a bowl or a ball of trouble a bunch of trouble right now um and i don't like everything that i did in those years i pushed the boundaries of ethics pretty far and i recently told the congress that when i testified mm -hmm. to the house uh judiciary committee in their investigation of the ethics failures at the supreme court so um, I got to see how our government does its work at the highest levels. And I thought I was doing the right stuff. Um, but in that third conversion that you alluded to, I awakened to the fact that I was not helping our country. I think I was in fact hurting it. I think I was hurting the church. And I think I was hurting especially the people in the margins of our human family. So uh, that that's kind of the setup for that mm -hmm. moment of crisis. So we, we want to talk to you about two topics in particular, which are guns uh, and abortion. And we're going to get to those. <laughs> but you just like opened up a whole ball of other things that yep. I want to ask about. Mm -hmm. um, so before we turn to that stuff, so I've heard um, what you called Ronald Reagan Republican religion. I've heard something like that referred to variously as the American civil religion, Christianism, Christian nationalism. There's all these terms that go around about it. Um, and a growing number of people seem to be realizing that whatever you want to call it, it is different enough from historic Christianity that it needs another name. It needs a separate label. Um, so can you describe what it was in your form and how you think it connects to what it is today? I'm guessing the MAGA version of it is maybe a little different. And then also, what what is it about it that's disconnected from historic Christianity? 
Yeah, wow, those are those are great questions, Colin. Thank you for giving me the chance to even attempt uh, an answer to them. Um, yes, you know what what people are now calling uh, you know MAGA religion or MAGAism or you know Trumpian evangelicalism and so forth is a bit more of an extreme version of what I was promoting um, in in my years because we always had a little bit of doubt about whether, you know, the God and country thing was a perfect match. Really? And curiously, one of the reasons that we, that, that my cohorts and I doubted that was because of the abortion uh, side of things, that we had, you know, one of the, um, you know, one of the most liberal abortion regimes uh, in the world, and that uh, we had one of the highest numbers of elective abortions uh, in the United States. So how how could we really say that we were kind of God's blessed country? So it always kept a, a sort of healthy bit of check there. Now, I wouldn't apply any of those tests today for many reasons, but we did back then. But Basically, what what I did and what what um, I would say by the time I had taken my seat of leadership in Washington in the late 1990s, it was pretty much a consensus that God was a conservative, um, that what we read in the Bible aligned with conservative values and sensibilities. And that um, the Republican Party was therefore uh, as a as the conservative bastion of political ideas and policies, um, it was the closest thing to the biblical revelation in terms of a political uh, instrument. So really, by the mid 2000s when you said evangelical christian you meant political conservative mm -hmm. political and cultural conservative so we had fused those two things and i think we see the worst of it now but even back then it was very hard for christians themselves to discern the difference between their identity as a follower of Jesus Christ and their identity as a constituent voter in the Republican Party. That those two things came to mean the same thing. And um, so that, I think, built the platform for what we now see as the heresy, I call it the apostasy, of Christian nationalism, which is the idea that God attaches his salvific plan to a particular people, ethno, uh, you know, geographic uh, population group, and a national identity, like being an American. So, you know, what became almost an anthem in the evangelical churches of the early 1990s was, I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> was, I forget all the words, but we used to sing it, believe it or not, like it was a hymn. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the best description I can give it without getting, um, uh, without boring everybody with technical definitions. Mm -hmm. So what has been the major transition to the current Trump version of it? Is it is it of a piece? Is it just the logical outworking of what you guys were doing in the 80s? Or is there a, a, a discontinuity somehow? Or even is Trump the kind of the outworking of what you were doing in the 80s, 90s and 2000s? Yeah, I, I really see Donald Trump as a product yeah. of all of that. Yeah. Um, 
a, a, a product and a project. Mm. And I'll, I'll tell you, in fact, I first encountered Donald Trump in person at Pat Robertson's 80th birthday party. Wow. And, you know, all the major evangelical luminaries in the country were there for this, uh, you know, uh, kind of wild celebration uh, at the Mayflower Hotel, a uh, prestigious venue in Washington, D.C. And I had already started struggling very, very badly with all of this. And I was in a real place of internal conflict. But I went because I was invited. And this was 2011. So I walk into this ballroom uh, at the Mayflower Hotel and I scan the room and I see all the big names in American conservative evangelicalism. And then I look over at the platform and there's Pat and some others and Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump was somebody I used to use as the premier example of what it meant not to be a Christian. <laughs> like, I grew up in New York State. He was always in the headlines. He was constantly, you know, the subject of the, the center of some kind of scandal. And he was just known as just kind of an awful actor. So we would use, I, I, my friends and I would use him as an example in our sermons of what it meant not uh, to be a, a, a follower of Jesus Christ. And here he is in the room, having not undergone any kind of transformation of any, he was exactly the Donald Trump I had grown up with in, in, you know, in the background in my life in New York. And here he was working the room, and it was very clear that the purpose for him being there was to learn the ropes of how you engage with major evangelical players. And it was kind of a, a beta test for him. It was a way, it was a safe room for him to test his messaging, to hold up uh, his mother's Bible and talk about his childhood at Marble Collegiate Church in New York and all the rest of it. And he was failing miserably to connect with the room. And I said to somebody <laughs> at my table, and these were all luminaries. These were big names. You guys would know them. Everybody who knows the last 40 years of evangelical history would know these names. And I said, what's this guy doing here? What? Why are we even entertaining him? And somebody at the table said, because he's just the kind of a-hole who will get everything done we need to get done in this country. There it is. Yeah. And when I heard that, I said, uh-oh, we, we are in very, very serious crisis. Hmm. And it was just about that same time that the filmmaker Abigail Disney found me and challenged me to look at the American evangelical embrace of popular gun culture. And all that stuff worked together uh, to get me to a place where uh, I finally broke with my community and I became a dissenter. So first of all, this is fascinating to get a seat in the room yeah. that no one else gets and hears about. But you just gave away then where we're going, where we want to go next. The Abigail Disney comes to you and says, we got to be, why are you Christians so obsessed with guns? Tell us about you. So you're on the mountaintop. You're in the room, Pat Robinson, Robertson's 80th birthday. That's the tip of the iceberg as far as the mountaintop that you were on. And then you came crashing down very quickly. Tell us about that descent in, it, it, or maybe ascent out of that, that world. Yeah, it was kind of both simultaneously. Um, and what had happened was I took a leave, a kind of leave of absence from my work in 2009. Uh, and I, I enrolled in a doctor of ministry program out at my alma mater, Faith Evangelical Seminary in Tacoma, Washington. 
And it gave me a little distance uh, from what I was doing. And in my work, I wanted to look at what happened to the churches in Germany in the lead up to uh, Nazism and uh, the catastrophe that was Adolf Hitler. And in my research work, and this was late in life, I was 50 something when I enrolled in that program. And, um, you know, it was a little late, but it, but it wasn't too late. And I, as I was looking at what's commonly called the German church struggle, which was its own identity crisis in the shadow of Nazism and the co-optation of the church in Germany. And, and I remind people that the largest body of Christians in Germany were known as the Evangelische Kirche, the Evangelical Church of Germany. And they would eventually fully embrace Adolf Hitler, Nazism, and uh, genocide. Um, and so I was looking at all of that and drawing parallels between what I saw happening in my evangelical world in the United States and what happened back then in 1920s and 1930s Germany. And it was shocking and it was deeply disturbing and it was unsettling. And so uh, I came back East uh, a few times during that period and eventually to that party of Pat's. And all of this indicated to me we're in very, very big trouble. And then when Abigail Disney, who, by the way, she's a great filmmaker, but she is, you know, I like to tell people she is not a Disney princess. Mm -hmm. Yes, she is the grandniece of Walt Disney. She's the granddaughter of Roy Disney, who built the Disney empire. Um, but she, she is hardly a, 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 a child of um you know un, unconscious privilege she knows where she, she is in the world and she uses her wealth and her name to do a lot of good she gives away most of her wealth uh in philanthropic ways and one of the things she has done is she has made these award-winning documentaries and in this case she wanted to she had traveled the country. She talked with evangelical leaders all over the country, asking them if they would simply take a critical look at why white American evangelicals were the religious uh, subgroup in the population most likely to own a firearm, to defend unfettered Second Amendment gun rights, uh, and to believe that uh, using lethal force uh, was a, was a God given was a, a God directed mandate. So she said, I, "I found a lot of people who questioned that, but they would not go on camera because they were so afraid of a backlash from their financial contributors, from their." constituencies uh, from their allies and friends. And she dared me. She said, you're the last person I'm talking to. And if I don't get, I'm, I'm going to go a completely different direction with the film if you say no. And I took a very long time to give her a yes. And I finally did with all kinds of caveats telling her I wanted out if this went wrong or that went wrong. But once I got into the project and I discovered friends, pastor friends that I had had for decades who were now armed in their pulpits. I remember a, a longtime friend of mine who I preached for routinely as an itinerant evangelist. And he said, Rob, I never go into the pulpit without my nine millimeter. I always have it on me. And I said, David, what, what are you talking about? Why are you doing that? And he said, I'm telling you, somebody comes into my church, stands up in the pew and makes a noise I don't understand. I'm going to take him right out 
from the sacred desk. And I said, all right, now, David, by that time, I had been through firearms training for the film because I had to get an orientation to my subject. So I had been trained by a professional U.S. Marine Corps firearms instructor. And I said, David, you know that the chances are nine to one, you will not hit your target. And that's why you have to fire every round in your magazine because nine out of 10 shots are not going to land where you want them to which means you're going to kill grandma or her granddaughter in, in one of your seats in your sanctuary. How will you ever recover from that? And he said, that's the price of freedom, brother. When I heard those things, I realized we're in exactly the same place that the Christians of Germany were in, in the late 1920s, into the 1930s, and would ultimately lead the Evangelical Church of Germany to declare Adolf Hitler, and I quote, this is a, a statement that was read from the pulpits of the Evangelical Churches in Germany when Adolf Hitler rose to the chancellorship in Germany, and it was proclaimed that Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party were gifts and miracles from God sent to return Germany to greatness. So when I saw how we were embracing violence as the Christians of Germany did, I said, uh, we're no different. And that's why I fully invested myself in that project, which you, you guys have obviously seen in the film, The Armor of Light. And I'm very grateful to Abby Disney for challenging me to do that. So, I mean, all of this is just jaw-dropping stuff, but could you give us some numbers as to what happened? How many, what was your budget before the film and you came out anti-gun and what was it after? What was, how many followers you had and how, what was it after? I mean, those are startling numbers. Yeah, well, you know, at that time I had 50,000 financial donors spread all across the United States. We had hundreds of churches that supported us. We had a uh, large number of what we call mega donors who were giving us millions of dollars, you know, in those years. Uh, well, you know, uh, I, I had raised 20, 30 million dollars. We had a headquarters building right on Capitol Hill. I had a staff. I'm, I'm ashamed to even say this, but, you know, plenty of times I was tooling around the city in a Cadillac Escalade, you know, executive car service at at, um, you know, $600 a day. Uh, and, uh, you know, everybody was flashing their, their COBOL cards, never mind Platinum American Express. That was, that was the cheap card. You had to have a COBOL card and the COBOL card you could buy a yacht with or, or a jet aircraft with. So people would flash their cobalt cards and, you know, I was flying on Gulfstream jets and all the rest. After that project, everything started um, scaling down very rapidly. People were very angry for me uh, taking on the questioning their God-given right to defend themselves. And that's what I questioned because the question that Abigail Disney, the, the producer and director of this film, had put to me early on was, how can you claim to be pro-life and pro-gun? Now, I wasn't a big gun aficionado, but I, 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 you know, I accepted it as part of the package, that part of freedom. I bought the line that if you can't defend yourself, you can't defend your family, you can't defend your community, you can't defend your God-given constitutionally protected rights. Um, I was suspicious of the federal government, and I bought the line that you needed an armed citizenry in order to check the powers of an overreaching federal government and all the rest of it. So I just kind of accepted it as part of the package. I was never a gun owner. I was never a shooter. But uh, obviously, the people around me were. And I, so I, it, it got me thinking deeply because I had been with national pro-life leaders who kept AR-15 rifles 
in their trucks and Glock nine millimeter semi-automatic handguns in their glove compartments. And one national Christian leader told me, I've trained my children to be marksmen. If a federal agent comes up my driveway, one of my kids will take him out at 30 yards. Um, there's a problem with that. <laughs> um, call it a keen sense of the obvious, but the more I heard this, and I heard worse, once we took on the film project and traveled the country and sat with pastors of rural churches to leaders of multinational organizations and heard the same thing, uh, that the Second Amendment was a God-given right and a moral obligation that Christians had a moral duty to arm themselves, I, I, I saw it as the ultimate uh, spiritual, moral, and ethical crisis. And I said so, and I was punished. I was punished for that. I was, I was basically exiled, and eventually I would have to leave that entire organization that I had built over those 30 years. Um, one financial supporter went with me. One one hundred dollar a month donor traveled with me. God bless him. That's all incredible. the rest was ready to do to me what they wanted to do to Mike Pence, hang me. Mm, and they said so. Wow. There's a scene in that movie where I knew this was not gonna end well for you after the movie. <laughs> and that was you were sitting around a table in a coffee shop or something yeah. with three other men who ostensibly i guess were your friends that's how it was presented anyway people you had known for a long time fellow pastors ministers of some kind and just very uh, respectfully and civilly and even hesitantly raised the question to them how can we is there anything christian about this gun thing how can we love jesus and also love the guns help me understand that and it quickly spiraled out of control especially for one of the dudes sitting across from you mm -hmm. um if you had if you had that conversation to do over again, would you approach it any differently? Was there any fallout from that? Because <laughs> it, it didn't. I kept hoping for some kind of resolution towards the end of the documentary, and it never came. Uh, I wouldn't do it any differently. Um, that the the, the main, uh, I guess, protagonist or antagonist, uh, however you want to look at that scene. And by the way, that was a a real. Uh, you know, real life, unrehearsed, first time discussion. No part of that was coached or prompted. It was organic. It emerged out of our time together around a table in a restaurant. And the film crew that Abby Disney, uh, you know, brought to this project, they were just consummate professionals. We were unconscious of a, of a film crew being in the room. They were so good at their craft. And that was raw, honest uh, exchanges between us. Oddly, I'm going to tell you that the friendship with the main guy, Troy Newman, who uh, is the head of Operation Rescue, the anti-abortion movement in the country, uh, the guy who quoted the NRA, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And you remember in the film, he says... And these are not scripted lines. This just came out of him, you know. Uh, he said, um, an armed society is a polite society mm -hmm. because you're not going to get in my face if you know, basically, we know. If I'm going to kill you, if I'm going to draw my weapon and fire a bullet into your forehead, you're not going to get in my face. So we're going to treat each other more politely if we know the other is armed. Mm -hmm. um that friendship survived it, uh, it, it's a strange friendship but we still communicate we still talk um i think he's supremely wrong i think uh what he's promoting is not just damaging but it's actually responsible for the taking of human life and that's where it becomes a complete contradiction of a pro-life ethic. 
uh, when you claim that you're saving lives on one side of the street, but you're prepared to take them on the other. One thing that my my um, Marine Corps firearms instructor said to me when I took on this training with uh, weapons, he said, unless you can get yourself to a place where you are ready to kill another human being, doesn't matter who they are, even a family member, because the greatest threats in a domestic situation are usually family members. So you have to be ready to kill in an instant without a second thought, because the moment you hesitate with your weapon, it's going to be taken from you in a violent struggle. It's going to be used to kill you, and it's going to go on to kill others. So you have to be ready. The moment you strap the weapon on your body, you are ready to kill, which means my friends, Mm -hmm. ordained ministers of the gospel mm -hmm. were getting up in the morning, putting a weapon on their belt, ready to kill even their own family members every day of their lives at church, in the pulpit, in the Sunday school room, in the youth group meeting, uh, at the grocery store, in their living room, in their bedroom. They were ready to kill. Mm -hmm. so all of this you know was part of kind of what was coming to the fore and you kind of see the the crux of it right there at that table in that in that heated exchange that we had and i put it to many many of my fellows how can we claim to protect life when in fact so many of us get up in the morning and prepare to take life. It's a, yeah. it's an oxymoron. It's it's an internal conflict and crisis, and it has demoralized American evangelicalism to a place where, frankly, I think we are moribund. I think we're on our way to spiritual and social and communal collapse. But I think. We're frankly doing more damage now than we are good. And that's a terrible, terrible place for us to arrive at. It took that film for me to really see it and feel it. Can I ask a follow up to what you were just talking about? Yeah. So I remember I had a, a similar brief, but similar firearms training experience with a military professional who trained SWAT teams after his military career and got pretty much the same speech, which makes me think it's standard um, amongst, you know, actual firearms training experts, which is that you don't wear this, you don't hold this until you have made the decision that anything you pointed at will be destroyed. There are no shooting to wound. There's no warning shot. You're trained to shoot center mass because that's what you're most likely to hit and empty the magazine and you don't call it a clip and you don't hold it like the stupid people in the films. <laughs> like it's, it's everything is about stability and accuracy so that you can maximize the chances of destroying your target. And if you're not willing to do that, you shouldn't own a firearm. Um, and there's this, this thing that a lot of people who are, you know, supposedly in favor of responsible, quote unquote, responsible gun ownership don't realize is that there is a kind of psychological baggage that comes along with that because most people would agree, the people at the table in that scene agreed that responsible gun ownership includes training. And yet the training comes along with this psychological stance, which is, I think you would agree, inherently anti-Christian. <laughs> um, it's the willingness to kill. As our one of our previous guests, Stanley Hauerwas, would put it, um, there is a there's an element of embracing nationalized violence, or in this case, personalized violence, I guess, that forces you to sacrifice part of your humanity just by being willing to approach other people in that in that way. So I really appreciate you highlighting that aspect that a lot of people don't understand. And so it's it's really easy to say there's all these sound bites, all these aphorisms about you know ways of deflecting the question of why guns are so bad, um, but to become a responsible owner and user of one, you have to do some damage to your soul. <laughs> and I'm saying this as someone who just got rid of my handgun a couple of months ago. Just wow. Months ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I lived with that tension for a long time. Sheesh. Yeah. We need to have a conversation. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And mostly, mostly because I just kind of put it in the basement and forgot about it. And my wife continually reminded me, but finally, you know, I'd been a pacifist for a long time before I was like, I need to actually get rid of this thing. <laughs> but yeah. 
yeah and and it you know you see part of a a message i preached on all of this in the film um and and in that message i warned that you know we have to be careful that in uh respecting the second amendment we have to be careful that we don't violate the second commandment and the second commandment i was thinking of was the second of the ten you know you shall not make for yourself a graven image or to bow down to it or to worship it and i, I will tell you kyle you know um i became a admirer of really nice engineering and uh tooling of firearms especially some of the handguns that are really lovely pieces of you know engineering and machinery and even aesthetically very pleasing the the look of them the feel of them they're almost a piece of art and how strange that you know i mean they are literally uh graven by human hands mm -hmm. and they become an idol because they become a false source of security and safety and even you know when you carry you, you know this feeling i felt it myself uh during those days of training you know, when you put a, a Sig Sauer 226 on your belt, you're the most powerful person in the equation, especially if you have an extended magazine. You're instantly the most powerful person in the room, in, in the collection. And so it gives people a, a false feeling of domination, of superiority, of power over others. The, the power to vanquish somebody if you feel they're a threat or you don't like them and all the rest of that. So when you talk about diminishing our humanity, I think it also includes diminishing our soul, our, our, our spirit. It most certainly, and I use this word with all the intentional pun, it, it militates against our our faith our relationship with god certainly you know living out the the virtues of the sermon on the mount that jesus gave us it's all wrong it's all contrary but it has taken over the american church like a fever i went out to utah to preach at a church that i was in two three times a year for 25 years and the pastor said to me after the film, after Armor of Light was released, he said to me, just before I, I went into the pulpit to preach, and it was a large church, one of the largest evangelical churches in the state of Utah. And he said, don't say a word about guns this morning. And he knew, I mean, the film was out. It was my subject. And he said, don't, don't even mention it. And I said, Mike, are you kidding? He said, no, I'm not kidding. I said, well, why are you saying that? He said, because I've got 50 people in the first few rows who are heavily armed. And if they don't like what you're saying, I can't guarantee you what they may or may not do. I don't want the trouble. Don't mention the subject. Well, I wish I could tell you that I was a Bunhofer, <laughs> uh, you know, brave guy. And I wasn't. I just left it out of my sermon. I didn't want, uh, you know... <laughs> I didn't want a firefight to break out in his sanctuary, but so um, this is this is a an enormous problem for the church, an enormous problem for Christians, an enormous problem for anyone who claims to follow Jesus Christ. And uh, so, boy, I, I get what you're saying, and you're an authority in a way I, I never have been because you know exactly what that what that feeling is. And, and let's be clear, this is an pr enormous problem for American Christians. I was interviewed by a conservative Christian in the UK a couple of weeks ago, and he asked me the question, if you could change policy, if you were president in Congress for a day, what would you do? And I was like, easy. I would, you know, outlaw 
all sorts of guns and, you know, enact gun control policies. And he, again, is a conservative evangelical in the UK. And he, he just looked at a computer screen and was like, yeah, we don't know what you guys are doing over there. It's craziness to us. So that being as it is, every time, which is almost every day now, literally weekly, daily, we have mass shootings in our country. We become totally anesthetized to it. We, it's just totally business as usual. And then every time a big shooting happens, you have this outcry and then you have the same just back and forth. We need gun control and then the other party saying we need prayer and and we need, you know, the NRA is buying these votes. Do you have you you were friends with these some of these people who are still in power in Congress. You were friends with some of these people who are in, on the Supreme Court. So you're I mean, there's no better insider perspective than you, Rob. Do you have any hope that any meaningful gun control regulation is going to be put forth and signed into law in this country in the next decade? Uh, you know, I, I never want to give up any kind of hope. And, you know, there are often so many beautiful things that surprise us. And I want to hold out for that. I will say there's no evidence that there will be any meaningful gun policy, not even sensible conversation on a on a government level about it until there's a revolutionary, pardon the pun, a radical shift in uh, the kinds of people elected to uh, the national legislature of uh, the House and the Senate. I think about the two Justins of Tennessee, these two, you know, uh, amazing souls um, who, you know, the Tennessee legislature attempted to eject uh, because of their, uh, you know, cry for reasonable gun policy in their state. After a mass and, shooting. Yeah, yeah, after the mass shootings, exactly. Um, and uh, I'm hoping both of them come to Congress someday uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, there's been some really good people elected, uh, you know, just even in the last election. So could it hit a tipping point in the next 10 years? Yes. There's a possibility of that. But I think it will require a prophetic uh, force in, in, our, in our society. And it will come as much, I hope, uh, from the church as it has from young people. But it's going to take something tectonic uh, to change that. And... Last question for me about gun control stuff. Um, are, are you, does that pessimism, because I share the pessimism, I mean, any thinking person who's watching what's happening in Washington in our national conversation can, can has right to be pessimistic about the, the current situation of that conversation. Is that pessimism more because of the money that the NRA throws around DC, or is it because of the ideological stronghold within conservatives about their love for guns and, you know, whatever. I think it's both. One feeds the other. It's a monstrous uh, symbiotic relationship. Uh, the NRA not only raises an enormous amount of money, they are very, very good at organizing, at least on the state and um primary levels. They're not so great. In fact, they they really fail on the national um, you know, campaigns, but on the the local, the state, and uh the primaries, they are very, very good at what they do. And they create an illusion. They they create fear. And and I go into this in the film. You you see this over and over again. We return to the theme of fear as a controlling force, which I think, again, is, is contradictory to the gospel, to the model, the ministry, uh, the message of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, but the NRA uses fear magnificently, exquisitely, both to put uh, national lawmakers in fear uh, that they're going to be turned out of, of you know, their, their offices in the next election. They use fear to control their own constituents and their own donors by telling them, you know, the next time you go fill up at the gas station, you're going to be uh, carjacked probably by a person with dark skin and you better be armed and ready. And of course, that fuels the manufacturers that make these guns and export them uh, to other countries. Uh, and they make a big windfall of money and they reward the NRA with with that money and they reward law uh, candidates with their money. So it all kind of feeds itself. It's a it, it's a grotesque and deadly incestuous uh, predatory uh, symbiosis that goes on. Mm. Yeah. So we want to talk to you about abortion as well. Before we transition to that, is it okay if I do like a quick rapid fire question round and ask you four or five questions that you kind of try to give your most concise soundbite version of an answer to? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. All right. So what I want to do is just give you a few sound bites that are super common that I've heard, heard a lot of them in that documentary about guns and just get your kind of off the cuff reaction. What do you think is a reasonable response to this sort of thing? Okay. These are all things you've heard many times before. So the first one is very well known. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. What's your response to that? If your vision is people shooting at each other, over each other's heads and killing children uh, who get in the way. If that's the world you want, uh, you know, that's what you'll have. Yeah. Number two, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Take the gun out of a person's hand. If you have somebody who's in a maniacal rage, which would you rather hand them, a baseball bat? or a semi-automatic weapon with an extended magazine full of bullets. Number three, we have a right and a duty to protect our families and the vulnerable. You're far more likely statistically to injure or kill a family member with a firearm in the home than you ever will be protecting them. Number four, I don't trust the government to protect me. I've got to do it myself. The government is of the people for the people, by the people, you send the people into government. Nobody else does. Lastly, the people in Washington want to take away our guns. I was in Washington for 35 years. I never heard that, never saw that. There was zero indication of it. Those are the fundraisers mainly who come up with those lines because they ring the bell every time and they get you to send in your 10, 25 and $50. Yeah. I appreciate you going through that Thank exercise yeah. with me because I think it highlights what you're just talking about, which is seeding, seed, like sowing seeds of fear that are rooted in nothing deeper than that. Like all of these sound bites are super easy to dismantle with a moment's thought. And yet they seem, including amongst your friends who you're speaking with in that video, including amongst my family members and friends who I've spoken with it about, they seem like deep seated convictions when they're spoken. Um, and it's almost and often spoken by intelligent people who would be able to think more critically than that in other contexts. And yet it's like a cloud comes over them when this issue is brought up and the soundbite is all they have. And if you question it, it's just flight or fight and mm -hmm. it, or, or fright <laughs> in this case, which is super ironic because one of the people in that scene accused you of being afraid, which just seemed like so much projection to me. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I tell some of the folks who repeat those things to me, you know, first of all, uh, I'm, you know, I'm about to turn 65. Uh, I've lived in, uh, you know, rural, suburban, very urban settings. I spent the formative years of my uh, ministry experience living with 15 recovering heroin addicts in a home uh, in what most people would describe as the ghetto. 
Uh, I've been to 44 countries, some of them at war. I've never felt uh, ever the need to strap a lethal weapon on my body to survive. Uh, why do you feel that way? <laughs> you know, uh, some of these people don't leave their communities. They, they never leave what is essentially their neighborhood. And yet they're terribly afraid. And, 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 and this is what I tell them with great pain, with, with, uh, there's no other way to describe it, with shame. I carry shame and regret and pain about this. But for 25 years, I sat with fundraisers who sent out millions of pieces of communication for me, for my organization, billions for all the national Christian organizations that they were contracted with and made hundreds of millions of dollars in profit from. And I would sit at a table and they would say things like this to me. Listen, I need, you know what I need from you? I need fear and I need anger. The madder I make your people, the more terrified I make them, the bigger the, the donation they're going to make to your organization. You understand that? You give me a little fear and I'll raise a little money for you. You give me a lot of fear and I'll raise a bundle of money for you. I had one guy who said to me, you give me a little, you know, you make people a little upset, a little angry. I'll raise a hundred thousand dollars for you. You make them mad as hell and I'll raise a million dollars for you. Now that goes on every day in the boardrooms of some of the biggest Christian organizations in this country, constantly, because they know the magic. They know what loosens people's hold on their money. And they create a fantasy, an imaginary world, where first, if you'll send me your $50, I'll make the world safe, ultimately, not immediately, but someday I'll make it safe for your grandchild. It, it, do we have time for me to tell you a little more of a story about this? Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay. So in one of those sit downs, one of my big fundraisers said, I want you to think of Helen. Helen lives on a rural route in Kansas. Her nearest neighbor is three miles away. She's a widow. She hasn't seen her kids or her grandkids in a year. And she lives in terror that the world her grandchildren are going to inherit will be a, 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 a country where they can't, they, they can't live their lives without looking over their necks because somebody's going to get them. The biggest event in that woman's life is when she reads your letter or your email. And I want you to tell her that the world is as bad as she imagines it, but if she will get behind you and your organization, you can finally change that for her grandchild, but not until she sends her next hundred dollars. That was a real conversation I had. That I heard that, and I resisted it at first, but over the years, I, I got it. I understood this is how you do it. And I shamefully acquiesced to it. And that, organ, that company sent out 3 million letters a year for my organization. There were 3 million Helens who got those letters. And those companies that live off these national organizations. Sometimes the ratio is eight to two to two. For every $10 they raise, they keep eight of it and they make themselves extremely wealthy. And $2 goes to the organization they're raising the money for. It is an enormous ethical uh, crisis in our country. And it's feeding all of this. It's feeding this catastrophe. So it's something we have to expose, lay it out, help people to see that very sadly, they're being played for fools and in the most 
dangerously corruptive way. And this is not talking about our politicians or our corrupt government. This is talking about the evangelical church, movers and shakers, not the not the crazy ones in the corner. These, these are prominent front and center evangelicals creating a Ponzi scheme to take money, to have power, and using fear and manipulation in order, in order to do it. I dare you to listen to what Rob's saying, listeners, and think, oh, evangelicalism isn't as bad as I thought it was. It's just kind of the, those are the outliers. We're talking about the power brokers with an evangelicalism. This is how they fund their, their whole world. Ugh, I, I want, we're going to need to take a bath after this. But, um, <laughs> can we pivot briefly to abortion, Rob? Yeah. Um, in the film, uh, I remember, I, it's been a couple of years since I've seen it, so it's not as fresh as Kyle, but I remember the striking image of you, I believe it was in 1992 in Buffalo, um, cradling a uh, preserved, preserved fetus in the early 90s, and you became kind of a legend in conservative circles because of how bold this was, and you became a villain in liberal circles. Can you tell us about that situation? It's kind of a microcosm of how bold and how, how, how just much you were convinced that this is this, I'm going to go to extremes in order to stand up for the unborn. Um, tell us about that moment. Tell us what went into it and your, your perspective on it now. Yeah. Um, well, there's a story behind that, a big one and one too long to tell here, but I'll give you just little pieces of it. One is, um, those fetal remains came from a pathology office in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I, I was out in Tulsa speaking at a pro-life anti-abortion rally, and a doctor came up to me afterwards, and he said, you got to see, you know, what I deal with every day in my uh, laboratory. Uh, it was his responsibility to process these fetal remains that were coming in from hospitals, from clinics, from uh abortion providers you know providers around oklahoma and i saw it um and i understood the power of those visual images but i, I want to say here and i don't mean to excuse it I, I think my my actions were inexcusable i don't think they accomplished what in the long term what i thought they did in the short term they were very effective in the short term but when I did that, when I took those human remains in my hands at the front lines of, uh, you know, an abortion, uh, the, there were pro-choice and anti-abortion uh, activists at each other over a police line in my hometown of Buffalo, New York in those days. And, you know, hundreds of us on either side of, of the conflict. And... Um, and I wanted to kind of shock everybody and, and uh, you know, make a, a big statement about this. And when I did that, I was thinking of a scene while doing missionary work in Central America. I had seen a family take their stillborn infant and cradle the child in their hands and parade the baby through the streets on the way to the cemetery. And I thought it was it was very beautiful and powerful imagery. And I was trying to model that. I, I don't think I did it well. I don't think I should have done it, but I did it. Um, but in doing it, not only did I, but many, many other national anti-abortion leaders discovered the power of these visual props. And we would use them over and over again. Um, I believed passionately in the cause. I was not a charlatan. I was a believer, true believer. To this day, I don't find a reason to celebrate abortion. I see it as a loss, as a point of pain, and maybe even failure. But again, my posthumous spiritual mentor, uh, Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he located the problem with abortion in society in general that fails to fully support women and their reproductive freedoms and their choices and their autonomy 
and even the support of their children. We fail miserably on all those points. And so you get the crisis of abortion. But I saw it differently then. I saw it as something we had to purge from our country, and I thought I was doing that well. Uh, there came a moment in time where I had to face the fact that I was not dealing with reality. And this is big. I, I know we don't have time to get into Bonhoeffer's theology, but he has the whole concept of reality. And Christians are given to creating imaginary worlds where everything works the way we think it should work, the way we think God wants it to work. And we created in our minds, and I had created a fiction in my mind. And in that fiction, any woman who was in an unwelcome pregnancy could find all the support she needed just for the asking. If she needed childcare, there were willing souls in the churches that would babysit her children for nothing. If she needed a job, there were employers in our sanctuaries who would hire that woman. If she needed health care, there were doctors who wouldn't charge for uh, pediatric visits and so on and so forth. And, and, and that was partially true in infinitesimal numbers, but nothing that could ever match the scale of the crisis. So I created that in my mind. And then there came a moment I was in jail for my protest activity. I was in the Montgomery County Jail in Montgomery, Alabama. And because of overcrowding in the facility, they had put me on the psychiatric ward. And there was kind of a poetic justice in that. But anyway, <laughs> I was on the, and weirdly, it was co-ed. There were men and women on that ward. We were in separate cells, of course, uh, and isolation cells. So there was no way to make contact with each other, but we could hear each other. And I heard a woman screaming. And this chokes me up. It, it's hard for me to even repeat this. But I heard this woman screaming the whole time I was there. And she, and, and she was obviously in great distress. And she said, where are my babies? Where... No, I have three kids. Nobody's taking care of where, who's taking care of my kids. My kids, where are they in the street? Where She was in absolute torture, screaming for her children, and nobody came to her aid. Not a guard, not a social worker, not even a chaplain. No one came to that woman's aid. And I would compartmentalize that. I put it on a shelf, uh, but it bothered me for 10 years because it blew apart my whole imaginary world. Where were all the rosy-cheeked white church ladies? Why weren't they on that cell block? Why didn't they come to that woman's aid? She was alone in her agony, in her pleading for her babies. And eventually that would come to the fore and make me realize that the real world is a world where a woman chooses, sometimes chooses abortion as the best solution to her crisis. And I came to finally, there's no woman on earth who needs my acceptance or approval of that, none at all. But I had to come to terms with it in my own soul. And I did. And it changed my whole perspective on what it means for a woman to make that decision. So that may be more than what you were asking for. No, thank but... you for that story. Yeah. Did you ever get a straight answer? to the question, how can you be pro-life and also so pro-gun? No, no, you know, th there are certain things that the movement I was a part of for so long um, refuses to answer or to look at critically. And that's a problem in evangelical culture, period. Um, 
And I speak only about evangelicals because that's my area of expertise. It's where I've spent my entire adult life. It's where I've been trained. It's where I've served. It's the people I know. So, you know, one of the biggest problems, I think, within e the evangelical subculture is our lack of critical thinking. We don't investigate. We don't interrogate. We don't ask the hard questions. And we most certainly don't answer those hard questions. Yeah. So this is my last question. It's a perfect segue. My favorite line from the film was when you said simple answers can be like heroin in your veins. Can you expand on that? Yeah. Well, you know, it gives you momentary euphoria. You feel like that was a good thing. You know, that's a great feeling. God said it. I believe it, and that's good enough for me. Doesn't that sound great? Makes me feel good. If I say to a woman in crisis pregnancy, you don't need to kill your child. There's somebody out there who wants your child, who will love your child, who will love you and take care of you. That feels really good in the moment. It makes me feel justified. It makes me feel that I'm doing God's work, that I'm I'm doing the right thing. I'm good here. I'm right. I'm okay. I'm I'm I've got it all together. I feel good. But it's really not doing any good at all. And in fact, it's it's hurting others. It's it's injuring myself because I'm detached from reality. And it's hurting others because I'm denying them the same privileges I enjoy. So it's like an addiction. It's like a chemical addiction. It feels great. It gives momentary relief. But over the course of time, it does great and continuous harm. So my last question then, Rob, thank you. Um, as someone who has spoken so profound or so much about abortion, anti-abortion, pro-life, talked about some of the, you know, even extremes you've gone to, and then we can hear a little bit about where your position is now, but could you just, I know a lot of our listeners, some of our, many of our listeners are very strong on one side or the other of this issue, but I know there's many, and I've heard from them who say, please talk about abortion. And we have a lot of fear and trembling as a couple of white dudes to talk about abortion, but you're somebody who's been in it, who's been, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid on the one side and you kind of had a, a moment of epiphany or whatever, and still seem to think that abortion is nothing to be celebrated, all that stuff. Can you just tell us, tell our listeners where you, what's your position on abortion now? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the white male part of it, because first of all, I will never really understand mm -hmm. abortion in all of its dimensions. I can understand it physiologically, I can understand it anatomically, I can understand it biologically in a technical sense, but I cannot feel it. I cannot know it. But something I've you know, way too late in life, even after, you know, going through my wife's pregnancies, Cheryl's uh, pregnancies with our two children and being present when they were born and then having family members who lost children, uh, lost pregnancies and so forth, even watching all of that and being very close to it, I cannot feel what it is to be pregnant. And I have a great enough respect for that to realize that is an awesome, complex, um, almost ineffable state of being. So I, I'm at an, a, a great um, deficiency in, in even approaching the question. But from a distance, First, I've come to appreciate, and this may sound like a keen sense of the obvious, but how unique every pregnancy is, every woman who is pregnant, every woman who considers pregnancy, who fears she may be pregnant or will become pregnant, 
what child how unique child birth is gestation and childbirth child rearing for a woman and child all those things are utterly unique so you can't apply a universal solution to every situation you know the reasons for abortion are are uh multitudinous uh when you talk to physicians even those who identify as pro-life and anti-abortion OBGYNs, um uh uh you know uh what, what what do they call them complex or uh complex pregnancy specialists i mean people who do in utero surgeries and so forth uh they will tell you no two pregnancies are 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 alike. Uh, every situation is utterly unique. So how can you go in and say one one answer fits all here? No abortion ever under any circumstance, or at least only when there is a mortal threat to the mother. And even then, there are a lot of voices who say that isn't even. That doesn't even qualify. So the point being, um, I've stopped opining a lot on this. W what I will say is that for the Christian, we have to understand that in every instance, there are a complex array of, of difficult questions and agonizing decisions that have to be made. And how dare any of us sit in judgment and say, no, I know every single part of your crisis. And I can tell you, I know more and better than you do. I think it's the height of arrogance, of hubris, of contempt for a fellow human being. In the end, here's my position, my position on abortion. It's complex. It's inscrutable, and I dare not impose my imaginative solution on another person in crisis. I need to walk with them. I need to be with them in, in every dimension to that. You know, for too long, I demanded that people in crisis leave their reality and enter my fantasy hmm. and this late in life i've realized that as a follower of jesus christ as a minister of the gospel as a fellow human being my job is not to demand that others leave their reality and enter my fantasy it's quite the opposite i'm to leave my fantasy and enter their reality and that's how I see the crisis of, of abortion. I pray and hope for a day when it's not a necessary option. But that's part of my imaginative fantasy. Yes. Reality is something very different. And it requires that I walk with people through the pain of their reality. Thank you for that humble and thoughtful answer, Rob. Um, for our listeners who I know we're going to have lots of listeners who are like, holy cow, I had no idea who Rob Schenk was before, but I want more of him now. Where can they find more of Rob Schenk? Well, probably start at um, Truth Revealed, which is my new column on Pathios called Truth Revealed. And it's just my opinions for whatever they're worth uh on a range of subjects but the you old can title for my... your opinions <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. thank you but um yeah you know people can find me there and um and then they'll find threads to where we can maybe um correspond personally and i do try to answer people sometimes it takes me a while to do it i don't have a staff i don't have a platinum American Express anymore. It's just me <laughs> all by myself. So uh, it takes me a while, but I do try to get to everybody if, if they're sincere. Excellent. Well, 
Rob, we've heard I've heard words come out of your mouth about your past of words like regret, shame, uh, embarrassed, you know, horrified. And I would just want to tell you, Rob, genuinely, um, you are an inspiration. Um, you give me pr a profound sense of hope that people in high places with millions of dollars at their disposal and the most powerful people at their beck and call can change that human beings who have dedicated their life to something can actually look at and say, I think I've gotten this all wrong and they can transform. That to me is possibly the most beautiful thing a human being can do. So I wanna just give you just so much credit and to say you're an inspiration for so many of us to say truth is there, beauty is there, goodness is there. And when you find it, when you're confronted by it, that's the moment when, when the true human comes out. So thank you for your work, Rob. Again, I'm inspired by you, and I really, really am grateful for your voice. That's very humbling, Randy. Thank you. All right. I would love to talk to you on a separate occasion just about Bonhoeffer, because I had so many questions about him, and we didn't get yep. to any of them. Yep. So if you want to speak to us again in, in the future, let's do that. Well, Cheryl always kicks me under the table when I talk about Von Hoffer too much because she that's says that's not I mean, a thing for us. <laughs> Literally half our podcast is philosophy, so we can go oh, home. Oh, great. If want to. <laughs> I'd love to do that. I'd love I'll... to do that with you guys. I, love I don't think he gets enough respect as a philosopher. And so I would love to talk to somebody who knows a lot more about his thought. Let's, I'll email you if you're serious. I'll email you and we'll put, we can put together another time if you have time, Rob. Sure, sure. Yeah, give me the summer to get through the transition yes. to the Miller Center and maybe in the fall. Okay, absolutely. That'd be great. Rob, I was excited to talk to you and it didn't disappoint. Thank you so much for your time to stay up late with us. It was really, really a pl pleasure to talk to you. No, I thoroughly enjoyed being with you guys. So uh, bless all the, the good work that you're doing. And you as well. Thank you, sir.